Hannah Lloyd's podcast. Jeremiah here with us, yeah. me and Jeremiah. This is Pierre, <laughs> this sultry voice that you're hearing, the, drinking a, if you can hear it, a margarita. <laughs> you need to do the sultry voice more often. We're getting real sexy in it. We are still on our solidarity with the screenwriters and the actors guilds. Keep striking until you get what you deserve. And we'll move right on to what I did this weekend. I went to a live script reading, Kevin Smith's Smodcastle, and then immediately followed that up with Terrificon in Connecticut. What is Terrificon? Terrificon is a Comic-Con that takes place in Connecticut every year at Mohegan Sun. It's a three-day convention. It's mostly comic-focused and actor-focused. They have a lot of actors guests, and they have a lot of great comics guests. For me personally, I had small goals. Well, relatively small goals for the show. I actually had a small goals for the weekend, but I'll get into that really quick. Going back to Saturday for me, I left from Syracuse and drove right into Middleton, New Jersey and hit up your local comic book shop. Went to Main Street Comics. Beautiful store. Lovely store. Very well put together. Some nice key books. It looks like a store that's very well put together. I like the drawer system. Drawer system's really nice there. I didn't pick up much there just because I'm a very picky collector, but I did get Fantastic Four Annual Number One, The Marriage of Sue Ooh. and Reed. And then two okay. Paula Rivera covers that were just cheaply priced, so I might as well just pick them up. I spoke to Mike there. He hides a lot of things. If there's something you're looking for, it's behind the scenes. Yeah, and it's likely. nice because the way that they have their key issues set up, I mean, I guarantee if I don't go in there for two months, when I come back, the keys are all going to be different. And it's not just because they sold, but because they're switching stuff out. So it does look beautiful, a nice, beautiful display, a very beautiful store. I didn't see it before the renovations, but they did an amazing job with that. After Main Street Comics, I went to uh, Comic Crypt, which was a comic book store that I meant to hit on my bachelor party, but they were closed when me and Kyle and Dimitri showed up to it. But I got to go inside. That was an also lovely store, a nice little small, very personal store. That was fun. And then I went on to Red Bank hit up the secret stash, and then there was the script reading that night. So the script reading was supposed to start at 7, and Kevin Smith lives above the theater. He has an apartment above the theater. And he came down at 7.45. So 45 minutes late isn't the end of the world, but as someone who's very punctual, 45 minutes late was driving me nuts. He then immediately said that we're probably going to go until 11 o'clock or midnight, and the event got done at 2 o'clock in the morning. But I did manage to get Kevin Smith's signature on my Daredevil 1.50. He actually signed right there on the Billy Club. Which is kind Very of nice. awesome if you remember watching the original Daredevil movie. Kevin Smith is the character who discovers that the Billy Club turns into the walking stick. So it's kind of funny that he signed on the Billy Club. I don't oh, think he did that intentionally, whoa. but I absolutely love that's where he signed. It's kind of near where his name is anyways on the cover because there's 154 names on the cover. That is a very cool, cool, like just callback. Even if it wasn't intentional, it's still kind of cool. I just love that that's where it landed up. It was awesome. I went to bed at three o'clock in the morning because the event got out at two, got to the hotel, slept until seven, woke up, left the hotel at 7.30 to get to Connecticut at 10.30. And that's when I hit Terrificon. When I went into Terrificon, I ended with the intention of getting 11 more signatures on this book, and I did succeed. I got all 11 that I was aiming for. Not wow. only that, but I brought Twizzlers for Jimmy Palmiotti, and he was blown away by I'm my... I'm not sure why that's a thing, but okay. He loves Twizzlers, and I found these like two-foot-long Twizzlers that I thought was going to be really funny to bring to him and it was really nice. funny and he was really appreciative and so he did a sketch for me for free oh my god yeah he did a sketch for me oh on the back oh my board for god free. what a wild little fucking book you got there now yeah <laughs> and the best part is like amanda connor she made it so that daredevil's thinking about her with her signature nice. and then her husband is right next to her it was a great show got to talk to a lot of creators the lines weren't super long it was a lot of fun i ended up getting a commission from dan jurgens i went with my friend russell from comicbook.com and he got this beautiful commission for me of dr solar 
by Dan Jurgens. It was a wonderful weekend, although I drove 800 miles and drove for 16 hours. Jaboy was tired. It was well, well, well worth it. I'm definitely going back to Terrificon next year. I cannot wait. This is my first time doing it, but it was done correctly. It's one of the best shows that I've been to. It's the best single day experience I've had at a con in a long time. Yeah, just really excited. It's got me really hyped for cons again. Baltimore's coming up and New York Comic Con's coming up. Are you doing New York? I don't know yet. I'm not sure. I'm not saying no. I know it's sold out, though. That's the only thing. And I don't know what day I can actually go. We have ways. Okay, make it a way and I'll go. Give me the way. Okay. Show me the way. I want the way. What day are you going? I'm going Thursday. And I know that Kyle and Dimitri are going Saturday. And I have a way I can get you to go Saturday. I'd say, fuck it. I'm not going to work. Yeah. I'm going to come again. I will see if I can finagle that for you. I have a way to get you a ticket. Donnie Cates will be there. Jason Aaron just got announced. Someone else just got announced that I just saw. But anyways, yeah. New York's shaping up to be a really good show this year. So I'm really excited for that. I do like these smaller cons, though. And I'm glad that you mentioned Terrificon because was it the Philly? Oh, yeah. You guys did Philly Fan Expo. It just was just an easier experience to navigate through. More personal as well. Yeah. New York Comic Con, it's like you don't have time to do anything either get your signature or move like don't talk to me i don't think you have the time and it's not the artist's fault it's just the platform they have to get through people terrific is definitely on scale with fan expo philly fan expo boston baltimore comic-con about the same size so i like the more personal shows new york has all the glitz and the glamour and everything is at new york you've got video games you've got comics you've got regular books you have the other stuff that we're not talking about but when it comes to like terrific or fan expo the other stuff is a small portion of it and comics is the main portion of it. It's just exciting to go to an event and feel welcomed and feel personal. And now I have 20 names on this book. I'm going to retire it at 50, I think. What is the goal here? Like, why all these signatures? Are these just your favorite artists or is this everyone that's worked on Daredevil? Yeah, on this cover, there are 154 names. Every writer and penciler that has worked on the Daredevil title from 1964 to 2014. This is the 50th anniversary issue. So it's almost 10 years old now. It'll be 10 years old next year. One of the funniest interactions that I had at the con is DG Chinster. He wrote, I think about 25 issues for Daredevil. He actually has a new series coming out in November called Daredevil Black Armor. Everyone should pick that up. But he is the only person on here who is credited twice because not only is he credited as DG Chinster, he's also credited as Alan Smithy, which is an name that people use when they no longer want to be attached to a title. Alan Smithy has directed like 70 films because if a director doesn't like his work, he'll put the name Alan Smithy there. DG was actually fired from Marvel, but he still had four issues of Daredevil that were left to come out. So he was upset with them and he had them credit him as Alan Smithy instead of DG. So he actually signed it as Alan Smithy as well. It's the first time he ever signed Alan Smithy. He was tickled awesome. pink when I asked him to sign it as Alan smithy so it's the fun interactions like that that we can't have in new york at least not that often they're very few and far between but everyone that i talked to at trificon the re interaction was like that like the jimmy pomelani sketch he did this in like two minutes not even he like pounded that out wow. in like two minutes so if you have a smaller show near you i highly suggest looking into it even if you have to travel a few hours i mean for me it was a six hour drive to trificon it'll be a five hour drive to baltimore it's a four hour drive to new york if you want to do a bigger show i wouldn't go more than like 10 hours or unless you're a veteran i wouldn't fly to a show just because whatever your intentions are flying can really hinder some stuff stuff you're bringing so on and so forth but as of right now i have fabian azetti Koi Fam, Cully Hammer, Jim Starlin, Kevin Smith, Claus Jansen, Chris Claremont, Mike Golden, Phil Hester, Alan Smithy and DG Chinisher, Richard Leonardo, Dan Jurgens, Ron Garney, Lee Weeks, Anne Nascenti, David Finch, Fred Van Linty, Jimmy Pomolani, and Amanda Connor all on this cover <laughs> so far. Wow. That's awesome. I don't know what that's going to be worth. You're definitely going to hold. I don't think there's a value to it. No. Yeah. And like the other thing about doing a project like this is people are charging for signatures now, which by all means, charge for your signature. You need to make your money. I don't know your financial situation, but if you worked in comics for a long time, you got screwed. Regardless of how long you've been in comics, regardless of what you've done, if you've worked in a long time, you've been screwed. So if you need to make money by charging for your signature, I'm more than happy to pay it. But when people see a project like this, they don't like to charge. 
They just like to contribute to it. I will always throw the money at them if they want it. If they don't charge me, I will take whatever fee that they normally charge and I would throw it towards the Hero Initiative. Always donate to the Hero Initiative people. That's the fun thing about this project is people will see it who normally charge and they'll be like, oh no, I don't want to charge you. I know what you're doing. You're not trying to like profit off of me. And if you're a flipper, you're a flipper. I'm, there's nothing against it. If that's your bag, that's your mm -hmm. bag. But for a project like this, there's no way I'm flipping it. They know I'm not flipping it. So that's something that I suggest people to do is to find a project that they enjoy and that they can have a fun interaction with a creator the guy behind you with 20 books for the creator to sign won't have but that's just my two cents in the aspect of it but yeah in terms of value i spend about 200 dollars getting signatures on the book but if everyone charged me it'd easily be close to three to four hundred like they realize you're not going through CGC and, you know, it's not the typical book. So I think they definitely treat you more like a real fan rather than just like a guy that's trying to make money. Yeah. And the amount of time so. people like take to look at the book, to check all the other signatures or to check the artwork out is a lot going on in this cover. There's 154 names and there's different homages to different eras of Daredevil just within the art styles. I almost want to just take that out, take it out and frame it. Yeah, I considered it. But like, I think until I retire the book, it's going to be fun. Yeah. There's no need. walk up with them and they have the sketch i think that's going to be the fun part of it i think that adds to it too because yeah. then people look at it and they're just like oh wow it's funny because jimmy pomelani's like what can we do for this guy because he brought me the twizzlers he's like no i'm not expecting anything i just thought it'd be funny to bring you two foot long twizzlers and he, once he saw the tattoo he just pulled the backing board out and started going to town Ooh, i couldn't stop sick. him not that you're gonna either if someone's just gonna go and do a sketch and it's like oh no please don't no <laughs> It was definitely a feeble attempt at stopping him, if anything. Yeah. Kevin Smith, what do you call it? Smod Castles is a theater that he owns there. And every week he's doing events. He's doing a watch with Kev where you'll pay... $15 to watch a movie and then he'll do a Q&A at the end of it. And then like once a month or once every other month, he's doing like a big thing. They got a big Chasing Amy thing coming up with Jordan Ann Smith, who was in Chasing Amy as Amanda. She'll be at the screening and then there's a Q&A afterwards. And they always do an auction before any of the events to help raise money to keep Smod Castles going. It's a theater. It's not a great time for theaters for lots of different reasons, but the best part is they do these auctions. So you have opportunities to get some really cool things. I put a couple bids out, but I always got outbid because everything went a little higher than I was expecting to. But he had a hat given to him by Stan Lee that said, I heart Stan. But the hat only went for like 75 bucks and I maxed out at 70, but there's a lot of cool things and it's always a good time. If you plan to go, it's your whole night. Don't make plans for the next day. Is that the same footage where Kevin Smith was talking about Batman Beyond? Because he just talked about that recently. Like that was like going somewhat viral. It was a similar event. It was the event before the one that I went to. He does smodcasts at the theater where people can ask him questions. And I'm sure that there's going to be tidbits from the thing that I went to, the script reading. It was the script reading for Superman Lives, which is the Superman movie he wrote in 97 that Nicolas Cage was cast for. We know about that cameo in that movie. And so if he read the script with his family and his friends and so on, and it directly adapted that the scene in that movie is a direct adaptation from a scene in the unused script, which was really cool when he got to it because you can kind of see what they left out. You can see what they messed with, but also the fact that it came to life at one point. Like That's he, actually really cool. Yeah, it was a fun movie. You basically hear unfold in front of you because they're just reading the script. There's no images, but it all unfolds in your head. And it's Kevin Smith. He ad libs a lot and it just has a good time with it. I will definitely be doing another one of the Smod Castle events. And they're doing it for a good cause. Trying to keep a theater that's been open since the 1940s alive. So go support. And I know we're having a embargo on talking about movies but this movie i will talk about 430 movie it's a movie that kevin smith wrote and directed if you're in the new jersey area they have gotten their waiver from the sag actors guild they are allowed to film because they have agreed to all of sag's demands so 430 film by kevin smith is going to be casting extra soon so if you're in the new jersey area pay attention they start filming in the beginning of august and so if you want to get paid to sit in a theater seat for 12 hours and possibly be in a movie Look into that. Smog Castles 430. You know, Jeremiah, I'm in the area. You are in the area. I am in New Jersey. And I would be interested in maybe getting paid. Yeah. 
So I know this wasn't necessarily a direct plug to this, but I think you may have just found your actor. And it's worth talking about because they are agreeing with SAG and it's an independent film and it's Kevin Smith. So that he's doing everything by the book and correctly. So it's going to be fun to see what happens with that. Anyways, moving on. It's a lot of talking from me. Let's hear some talking from you in our <laughs> segment. Pull or pass. What was your favorite book of the week? You know, Jenny actually asked me that before this podcast started, like five minutes before. <laughs> and I could not answer that at all. Like I was like, everything was so good. I want to say Magneto was my favorite because I was generally surprised by that one. I didn't see it getting me the way it did, but I was like, wow, it's a cool concept. We'll start with Magneto. You tell me the names, Jeremiah. You're the name guy. The Mattis, yep. All right. And Todd Newark is a famous artist. He's a great artist. Very quick artist as well. He can pound out pages way faster than most people, but he's fantastic. So him on anything is definitely worth reading. So right off the bat, I mean, it gave me a very like 90s vibe X-Men. So I was like, this is kind of cool. J.M. DeMattis was huge in the 90s. That checks. You're following a younger crew of the X-Men. They're all gone. Xavier's dead. Magneto is leading. So at first I was confused. So what was happening because the young team was fighting the brotherhood and Magneto was like kind of voicing over it. And I was like, all right, why are they fighting them? Like, it didn't make any sense. And again, I don't know how this fits into what's going on with everything else with X-Men. Krakoa and all that. Yeah, like Xavier's dead in this. Is he dead in Krakoa? Anyone watching this, you tell us what's going on with Krakoa, because honestly, I've been avoiding that at all costs. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. I thought the idea was cool at first, and now I'm just like, can they die? I need them to die and stop. I don't <laughs> do mutants for a reason. <laughs> we can't keep doing this. We just can't. Like, they I can't agree. just come back in a chamber. <laughs> like, bring them back in another other event i'm okay with it it's fine but like it's too rapid fire so it's hard for me to keep track of all that but this one kind of felt like it was on its own thing and it just followed magneto kind of going through his head and what he was and what he is now and how he basically saw everything that he was he did on purpose like it was his mission to like everyone's always seen him as the bad guy but it was always his mission to be the bad guy mm -hmm. like he wanted everyone to see him as the bad guy hate mutants because of him give people a reason to love mutants and that was the x-men defeating him beating him like they could see the good in mutants. him taking the loss for the better good correct yeah. and yeah so it just follows that you know he's obviously turned a leaf he's leading this team and it's actually really cool like they introduce a lot of new young people that i'm not too familiar with maybe other people are new mutants you mean new mutants yes yes <laughs> to be politically correct say this is a poll definitely a poll it has a nice twist at the end so i'm not going to spoil that i think the cover actually sets it up very well for what he's going through did you just get the a cover the todd cover yeah i wouldn't ask for a better magneto cover a nice tribute to who he was who he is for me one of the books that i read this week red sony number one dynamite relaunching red sony for the hold on let me count eighth time the right name Thorin Gorbik. Have you ever heard of anything from Thorin? She was on a few titles. <laughs> she definitely knows how to write women very well. That helps. That does help. When you're a woman writing women, I think that's, you know, there is a thing to that. <laughs> yeah. She does a good job of getting into Red Sonia. And if you're a big Red Sonia fan, you're obviously going to pick this up no matter how it goes. But if you're not a diehard Red Sonia fan, I would say pass on this just because you got to really have the majority of her lore down and uh, her canon to understand all the little nuances that are in this. Because Thorne does a good job of placating to the fans. Red Sonia fans are diehard Red Sonia fans. If you're looking for a new series to pick up and try, this might not be where you want to go. If you want something new that you can get lost in years of backstory, then yeah, I'd say pick this up. But as a staple right now, pass on it. There's some pretty, pretty covers, literally pretty covers. If you're a cover collector, Mike Bignola did a wonderful cover for this issue. But in terms of content, I would pass. I actually have a funny story about this. How do I start this? <laughs> so oh mystery boxes always pull me in every time. Every you time. have a gambling addiction. That's how you start. <laughs> so I walk into Comic-Con. We're on a mission. I forgot where we were going, but we're walking. And right to my left, I look, mystery box, $25. Like, I, I'm doing this. I didn't know it was artist specific or writer specific. You just saw a mystery box and decided to burn your money. So it ended up being a Red Sonia mystery box. Really? Okay, that's pretty awesome. And yeah, for someone that's like into Red, Red Sonia. Sonia. To me, I think it's something related to Hercules. Is it? I don't know. It's really no into Conan the Barbarian. Okay. So there you go. Everything I got in the mystery box was sick. I have some really exclusive variants and 
one of cover like it is cool stuff and then they walked me over they're like oh and you can get it signed by the writer and artist he's right here and i didn't know what to say <laughs> because i don't know anything about red sonia so i had to pretend to be like excited and like it's nothing against red sonia it's nothing against the writer nothing against anything i just never followed it so i'm in this situation where i have this mystery box that i'm supposed to be excited for talking to this artist and the writer and i was like oh my god do you still have them or did you let them go no they're here somewhere i finally filed them away in my box that's kind of funny though because you knew nothing about red sonia and that's the mystery box you got that's awesome yeah and then I got a poster one, too. Again, not realizing that this was just a Red Sonja table. The poster one, it was Marvel Zombie posters, but it wasn't Marvel Zombies. It was Arthur Sedame artwork with dynamite characters. Yes. Yeah. yes. It was literally that. Yes. <laughs> so they walked me over. They're like, oh, this is him right here. If you want. I was like, oh, great. At least you got your money's worth. Not only did you get the products, but they were trying to give you an experience with it. Whoever is listening to this, if you are a Red Sonja fan and you see a mystery box table for Red Sonja specifically, like look around, make sure. I'm telling you, it's probably a good table. So <laughs> you're going to love it. All right. So I wasn't going to pull the Incredible Hulk, mostly because I like the direction that Donny Cates was taking it. Now we have a new writer on it, but it was a writer that we're very familiar with. Do you know who's on it currently? I do not. Philip Kennedy Johnson. Oh, PKJ. Yeah. So you have writer Philip Kennedy Johnson and Nick Klein as your artist on it. So it kind of picks up off of what Donnie built. And Bruce is kind of just scared. I contained him for so long and now he's getting out. Like you have no idea. Hulk is mad and you got to get away from me. So Hulk is vengeful right now. And it takes a very dark twist on the Hulk. Evil shit. Like, people are dying already. Like, I don't want to spoil it at all. Honestly, I want people to just get into this. We're two issues in now, right? I'll give you the first issue. You open it up. They're in a tomb. Girl touches, like, a skull. Someone's like, oh, uh, is everything okay? She turns around and a demon comes like blasting out of her head, like just like rips her apart, almost like alien, like just rips her apart and just starts killing everyone. And I was like, what the fuck just happened? Because I don't expect this from a Hulk. Book. Yeah, a cult Hulk. Got me excited to think about that. Uh, honestly, I would now put the occult and Hulk together, but I might have to go grab this now. It's totally different from what the Hulk was, again, under Donny Cates. Like, where do you take it from where Donny took him, which took him on a whole cosmic adventure fighting Thor? And again, he was containing him within his head. And I thought that was sick. But this, it was dark. And now I guess the second issue you're in, because I picked up one and two this week. And two, they're zombies. So they're bringing back someone. I don't know the name, but yeah. So zombies, witchcraft, demons. Definitely got to go pick this up tomorrow. Hulk went into PKJ. And who's the artist? Klein again? Klein, yeah, Nick Klein, Klein on that one. It's funny because after reading it, I thought back to your interview, just hearing it and hearing how he was and everything. I'm like, Jesus, like, <laughs> like this man's a genius. He knows how to take overly powerful characters and give them a human element. He did that amazing with Superman, and he's also a big horror freak. He loves the alien, so having an occult That's where that came version from. of the Hulk, yeah, I'm sold. Oh, and it's an homage cover. Oh, that looks fucking awesome. I love the homage, first off. Mm -hmm. And then number two, it's just sick artwork. And again, you see the zombies in it. I mean, I just never expected that man thing's in it. It's like, what the fuck? Fun comic fact. Comic fact! Comic fact time! Swamp Thing and Man <laughs> Thing appeared one month apart in the comics. But remember that comics have a three-month lead-up time in order to reach publication. Swamp Thing was created by Bernie Wrightson and Len Wein, whereas Man Thing was created by Marv Wolfman and Al Poog. I'm not 100% sure. But the fun comic fact is at the time, Marv Wolfman and Len Wein were roommates in New York City. They were working for opposite companies, mm. but they were roommates. And they both borrowed heavily from the Golden Age character, The Heap. So Man Thing and Swamp Thing's origins can be traced back to the heap, but it can also be traced back to one single apartment in New York City in 1973. Moving on. That's funny. So for my next Polar Pass is definitely a poll. We got the second issue of Ultimate Fallout 2 by John Hickman and yeah, Brian Hitch. Oh my God. 
fantastic second issue. We now know for sure now it's a four part mini, but I don't think it's going to stop at four parts. I think we're getting a whole new shebang out of this. The maker making his universe the way he wants it to and fixing every problem he can think of, including sabotage before it can happen. The way that Howard is written in this, Howard Stark, not Howard the Duck, although I wish. It happens though. Yeah, There's still could, room for Howard the Duck. It could. If you are not reading Ultimate Fallout, you are doing yourself a disservice yes the price point is higher than a normal comic first issue was 5.99 and i'm sure the next two are also 5.99 you're shelling out more for this book but it is a premium book it is some of the best stuff marvel's put out this it. year if not in the past five years even with just these two issues very excited to see where it's going definitely pull what did you think of ultimate fallout here one and two has just been amazing. So one definitely set the tone for where we were going with this. Just with the ending spoiler, we have no Spider-Man anymore in this universe. So he ended that real quick. And we got confirmation in the second issue that there is no yeah. Spider-Man here. So now it raises the question, what's he doing with all these things? Because he is clearing out everything, like yeah. everything and everyone that could affect him. He's making sure it doesn't happen. And then not only that, but there's stuff that he can't control. There's stuff that has to happen, but he's neutralizing those targets. He didn't mm -hmm. let the Fantastic Four become the Fantastic Four, but he couldn't stop Bruce from becoming the Hulk, but he neutralized Bruce. So like the fact that the maker is taking everything into account, but he's still playing a game of cards. And that's the exciting part. He's trying to read everyone else's hands by counting the cards. I'm so stoked for the rest of this series. The ending, I don't want to spoil it for people. What did you think when that helmet came off? Oh, yeah, I was just like, wait, like, what is happening here? It asks a lot of questions at the final second. It's hard not to spoil it. Like, I, I don't want to say exactly what my thoughts were because I was just like, fuck, oh, shit. That's all that needs to be said yeah. about it. Predicting this ahead of time, right? They, they haven't given us enough to predict it. But I feel like Miles is going to be a part of this. Miles is going to be your end all. 100%. I think Miles is coming back to the Ultimate Universe. And I think the way that they're going to go about it is in the second issue, there's some portals that open and some people come through those portals and something happens to those people. And I think it's going to catch on with the Illuminati in the 616 universe. And they're going to have to send somebody that he can't erase. And in order to do that with Miles, there's only one other person from that timeline. That's where the showdown is most likely headed. That's my guess. But I can't yeah. wait to ride the rest of this roller coaster to see how it goes. That being said, Panel is Podcast. Panel is Podcast. So there you go. That's how misleaded I am. <laughs> That's great. Yep. That, uh, <laughs> you got that, Kyle. I don't know if we're on speaker view right now. <laughs> I don't know if 